Hello, I'm Dr. Daniel Griffin. And I'm Dixon Dupontier. And today we're going to be discussing cholera. Right. Cholera is another one of those, those classic diseases, wouldn't you say? I would say so. It's uh, one of the things that has, uh, not only has it plagued humanity, but it's been the source of novels of... It's true. Yeah, it's captured the attention of the world because it's, it is a worldwide infection. And it, we can tell exactly when it started. It's one of those rare instances when the, um, the historical record allows us to trace back to a certain incident and we can relate it to weather and we can relate it to the season and the year and we can relate, uh, relate it to the closing of the East India Trading Company. Which was I, a, I feel like there's a story coming. There's a big story coming, but we don't have time for the story, unfortunately. Let's but squeeze it in. Let's squeeze it's, it's it in. We can, we can hear story. some of the story, I think. So uh, to make it very brief, the um, East India Trading Company was in its last year. It's uh, 1836. And it was in the Bay of Bengal. It had delivered its goods to India. It had picked up more goods from India to be, bring back to the, uh, to the mother country of England, which at that point thought they owned India. Of course, that was all wrong. But what they did bring back was bilge water from the Bay of Bengal. And it was during the spring of that year. And in the bilge water was the entire ecosystem of the Brahmaputra and Ganges River that emptied out into the, the Delta region of that wonderful part of the world. And with it, of course, the cholera organism unbeknownst to them, of course, and they come all the way back to England. They unload their cargo. They unload the bilge water, contaminating the Thames. And the next thing you know, they've got cholera in England for the first time. And that's when all the classic epidemiological studies emerge from the early history of infectious diseases and um, Snow's treatise on cholera is a required reading for almost everyone in the world who wants to become an epidemiologist. And it's all about how cholera is transmitted through contaminated water. With what? It's contaminated with human feces, which contains the organism. But that's not the whole story. The whole story is where does cholera even come from? And what is it? Yeah, it's a bacteria. Mm -hmm. And it's a bacteria that plays a very important role in nature that has nothing to do with disease transmission. It enables a small, what you might consider insignificant copepod. It's a little crustacean that lives in the water. We call them water fleas, is we that We call fair? them water fleas or cyclops, that's another name for them, or dioptimus, they have lots of names. But the one I'm thinking of has two large egg sacs. And these eggs contain more copepod. And in order for the eggs to actually get out of the egg case, they need help. And that help comes from cholera organisms. They contain a cellulose, a chitinase, which absolutely covers the surface of this egg sac on both sides. And at a given moment in the life cycle of the copepod, the bacteria are induced to produce the enzyme, which then dissolves away the egg case, and it releases the eggs. And that's the role of cholera in nature. Enough of that story, because there's an ecology associated with that that's absolutely precious. There's a lot of history of doubt and uh, dismay on the part of the established microbiology community. Yeah, so this um, is so cholera is great for people that have problems with authority like myself. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um. Rita Caldwell <laughs> is a... Um, a marvelous example of a person who, from the moment she started to work on this infection, knew that she was on the right track. And no matter who told her otherwise, she continued to work steadily on revealing the true nature of the, uh, the role that cholera plays, not only in nature, but how it spreads from point to point. And so I think it's a, a fantastic read that is highly worth your effort to grab a hold of that literature and to, and to look at it, because it, it really connects a lot of things that we don't think about ordinarily when we think about infections. We don't think about weather conditions that might be affecting the spread of something. We don't think about the ecological setting 
in which these diseases take place, but of course they do have their place in nature. And um, at any rate. Well, no, I think your, your story is hopefully gonna be helpful for people remembering where do you, where do you get cholera? Right. And so you're gonna get cholera from, from water. You do, well, well. Contaminated water. Yes and no. Tell, tell us. Yes and no. <laughs> because in the delta that leads out into the Indian Ocean, this is a rich area for harvesting seafood. And indeed, there's a season for that. And that's, it's a, initially a foodborne infection that becomes waterborne. So it starts out as a foodborne infection from someone harvesting something from the brackish waters of these rivers that deliver their goods into the Brahmaputra, uh, into the uh, ocean rather. They bring them back to their village. Meanwhile, they're hungry, so they're eating them on the way and they're raw mm -hmm. and they're acquiring cholera. The next thing you know, this person's got diarrheal disease. Maybe the cholera organism doesn't survive long enough to make it to the village, but this person does. And from that point on, it becomes a waterborne infection. And that was a difficult connection to make. That's where Rita Caldwell really shown as an individual who believed that there's gotta be another answer to this. I have to keep looking for the connection between the seasons, the diets, the mode of transmission. This is all, it destroyed all of the common knowledge that existed up to that point. By the way, she also went on to become the president of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, and that was by election. So she had to have the support of lots of different people in order to do that. And uh, it means that perseverance and brains triumphs over tradition and prejudice. That's, she's a living proof of that. Right. She's, she's one of my biggest heroes. So back to cholera. Back to cholera. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, as we, as we started, so we have this relationship with the shellfish, with the copepods. Exactly. Uh, but then once we start having human infection, yeah. we're going to be able to trace it back to contaminated water. That's and an interesting thing, when people go to areas, I say, I'm traveling, do I need to worry about cholera? In general, mm -hmm. acquisition of cholera illness requires a large inoculum. So this is usually not something we see in tourists. It's usually something we see in people living in endemic area who do not have access to clean water. And by clean water, I mean water that is either clean to begin with or water that is boiled or treated. Right. Um, once you get exposed to a significant or an adequate inoculum, this is not in the low inoculum disease, it takes about one to two days in general before you develop symptoms. But that incubation period can be as soon as several hours if it's a large inoculum, and it may be as long as five days if the inoculum is low. Correct. So often early on in an epidemic, you might see a gap, but then as a community is having a lot of diarrhea, a lot of contaminated water, then you may be seeing quicker, earlier onset diarrhea. That's right. We say diarrhea, and so let's describe the diarrhea. It's classically described as? Rice water diarrhea. Okay, what, what is this rice? What is that rice? Is that really <laughs> rice or is it something else? And it's something else, basically. It's the sloughing of the epithelial cells in the small intestine. That's actually what you're looking at. So this organism induces a secretory diarrhea, which precedes the exit of the organism by only a few hours. The organism at that point is gone from the gut tract. It doesn't even reproduce very well inside of a mammalian gut tract, but it leaves its toxin behind. And it's the cholera toxin that causes all the difficulties. You want so to pick the it up? rice, I'll pick it up. <laughs> So the classic description is a voluminous rice water, so a watery diarrhea. Um, the diarrhea can be up to a liter per hour. Exactly. So a pretty significant amount of volume loss can be yep. associated. So dehydration can also be part of this. A certain percent of the time, I'm gonna say about 10%, but it depends upon inoculum, there is a variant where there is vomiting Oh. which can be a huge issue in right. trying to hydrate these individuals because it's, 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 exactly. they're losing it, they're vomiting, right. and you can't replace the, um, the fluids. That's right. Usually, got all this diarrhea, there's usually very little abdominal pain. 
is usually not associated with cramps. Right. So they are having this voluminous rice water diarrhea. It's got a fishy odor. They may have um, vomiting in certain cases. Um, and they're usually going to come in initially several liters behind with a certain amount of dehydration when they initially come to medical attention. Um, what about diagnosis? <laughs> this is an epidemic. <laughs> and that's, that's perfect. This is an epidemic. This is usually something that is being um, diagnosed as an epidemic. You're right. seeing lots of cases. Now, initially, you may see um, a first case. And there is a the, the rapid stool dipstick diagnosis. So you can, um, early in the epidemic, you don't know it's an epidemic yet. That's You'll true. know it's an epidemic later. That's right. Um, but the first few cases, you may just think it's it's some other form of diarrhea. Yep. Um, once the epidemic is established, you're, you're not going to be doing a lot of testing. You're going to be no. basing it on the fact that you have an outbreak and the patients are coming in. Very true. Um, certain places I've been in um, Hyatania Coredia, pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure, but a <laughs> hospital in um, in Peru oh, right. and out in Lima. And I was speaking to one of the, um, actually it was one of the guards. It was not one of the physicians. Huh. And we were talking about, they have these big gates and they control the flow of patients. Oh, and he was telling me oh, the story nice. of during one of their outbreaks, sure. when the patients would just basically start lining up oh and, and the guards would know, oh you know, here are, here are this large crowd of people with watery diarrhea wow. wanting to be seen. Wow. And so, um, so it can become quite recognizable um, once you're in the midst of an epidemic. Great. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about treatment. So we've recognized it maybe with culture, maybe with the rapid dipstick, maybe because you're in the context of, a, of an outbreak, an epidemic. Yep. Um, but what about treatment? You have a bacterial I'm infection. Not a, I'm not a doctor. Why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can give you the answer, but I, I don't want to spoil the story by by preceding uh, the uh, <clears throat> the gems of wisdom. No, but I think this is so. This has changed over time, and I think this is interesting. Um, the normal knee jerk reaction, I think, when someone has a bacterial infection, is to reach for the antibiotics. Correct. And I'm actually going to say that currently antibiotics are only recommended in severe cases. Do you want to see a demonstration of the real treatment? Please, please show us. Mm. Not, is that missing something? It is missing something. <laughs> it's missing salts. So you take a handful of salt and throw it in a certain size pot of water you boil the water to kill off all the microbes that might be in it because you got the water from a local source, which may have been the same source as the cholera organism. And you spoon feed this to your child. Spoonful by spoonful for three days. On the fourth day, the child gets up and walks away. Totally cured. No bacterial antibiotics, nothing. Just rehydration. So that's, so that's <laughs> what I'll say is aggressive rehydration. Yeah. Oral, in most cases, is the mainstay of therapy. That's right. Um, when the individuals first come in, they will be significantly dehydrated. So the first thing you're doing is trying to bring them up to a hydrated level. Mm -hmm. And then you want to start matching um, rehydration with fluid losses. Exactly. So um, actually, that has reduced. So the mortality of untreated cholera is 50%. If you do nothing, 50% of people will die. If you follow proper rehydration approaches, 1% will die. Correct. So it's a dramatic reduction in mortality. Without treating for the bacterial infection, because by that yeah. time there is no bacterial infection. That's the idea. This organism lives in the estuary of the Brahmaputra Delta. That's where its habitat is, not the gut tract of a mammal. It will survive for a few time, for a few cycles of reproduction, but mostly it's an organism that lives in the environment. So you're really treating what the toxin does. Now, have we have time to talk about where the toxin comes from? No, but let's Too talk. Too bad. <laughs> but let's talk a little bit more about um, how we're going to approach rehydration. Oh, okay. Um, so oral rehydration has actually 
become quite sophisticated. And as a consequence, we've made huge strides. Great. So um, diarrhea disease, when I was growing up, was responsible for 20,000 deaths per day in children worldwide. Per day. Per day, 20,000. Wow. So this was an enormous amount, right? You start doing the math. That's and crazy. Yeah. So 70 million deaths a year. That's huge. Crazy. How do you keep up with that? Exactly. Um, and one of the huge advances mm -hmm. yep. was properly um, created oral rehydration solution. Yes. And so these are now made as packets. They're also are instructional. And so it contains salt, right. glucose, yep. potassium, yep. and a um, bicarbonate. So a base of some sort. Nice. And done properly, and we address this, I think, in a little more detail in our dehydration, diarrhea, general overview lecture. Um, done properly, um, you can actually reduce this mortality down to 1%. 1%. So it's not very high tech. Um, the interesting issue, I know Dixon talked about, you want to boil that water? It takes a lot of resources to boil water. No kidding. I know, I know. So, if you can boil it, it's better. So you, if you can boil it, that's fantastic. In a lot of parts of the world, you are rehydrating yeah, with know. the same stuff that got you sick. No, that's true. So it's it's a challenge. It is. It's a challenge. It is. But the mainstay of cholera therapy is oral rehydration. Occasionally, when someone has vomiting, you're not going to be able to rehydrate them through the oral ret, and you may require parenteral intravenous fluids. Right. And those have to contain the same things you're losing. Yes. And very rarely, very rarely are you going to use antibiotics. If you do use antibiotics, the reason we're saying don't use them unless you have to is because of growing antibiotic resistance. Of course. Um, particularly to the fluoroquinolones, so oh. things like ciprofloxacin. So if you do actually treat them, the recommended treatment is azithromycin for an adult that's going to be about um, one gram times one. Um, for an alternative, it might be doxycycline. Um, and in children, zinc supplements. Zinc supplements. Zinc supplements. Which aids in their immune system. And has been shown to actually have a mortality benefit in acute diarrheal That's syndrome. That's fantastic. Now, the reason why you do it for three days is because the crypt, below the crypt, the intestinal cells are intact. It's only at the villus tip that the, the, in the, the epithelial cells slough. It takes three days to repopulate the villus. That's the reason. All right. So make it through those three days. All right. Thank you for joining us for cholera, and we hope to see you again soon. We'll see you again. <laughs>